this, Lord. Thank you, praise and worship team. For the encouragement and the worship through songs. There are messages that we have to meditate. We are thankful to your ministry. Good morning to everyone. My buntag. Shall we open our Bibles? Genesis chapter 22. We'll have some readings. From the New King James Version, let me read to you the passage. Now it came to pass after these things that God tested Abraham and said to him, Abraham, I said, here I am. Then he said, take now your son, your only Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering in one of the mountains of which I shall tell you. So Abraham rose early in the morning and saddled his donkey and took two of his young men with him and Isaac his son and split the wood for the burnt offering and arose and went to the place which God had told him. And on the third day Abraham lifted his eyes and saw the place afar off. And Abraham said to these young men, Stay here with the donkey, the lad and I will go yonder and worship and will come back to you. So Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it on Isaac his son, and he took the fire in his hand and the knife, and the two of them went together. But Isaac spoke to Abraham his father and said, My father, I said, Here am I, so my son. Then he said, Look, the fire and the wood, but the, where is the lamb for a burnt offering? And Abraham said, My son, God will provide for himself the lamb for a burnt offering so the two of them went together then they came to the place of which God had told him and Abraham built an altar there and placed the wood in order and he bound his uh, son and laid him on the altar upon the wood and Abraham stretched out his hand and took the knife to slay his son but the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. So he said, Here I am. I said, Do not lay your hand on the lad and do anything to him. For now I know that you fear God, since you have not withheld your son, your only son, from me. Then Abraham lifted his eyes and looked, and there behind him was a ram coat in a thicket by its horns. So Abraham went and took the ram and offered it for a burnt offering instead of his son. And Abraham called the name of the place, the Lord will provide. As it is said to this day, in the mount of the Lord, it shall be provided. I was given this task to expound on this passage, Genesis chapter 22, with the theme entitled, The Lord Provides. Shall we pray first? Thank you, O God, our Father. Here's your word, the living word. Once again, we are here to listen from you. Grant wisdom to your servant, even as he will expound this passage. May the words of my mouth, the meditation of my heart be acceptable to you. This is, I pray, in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Let me open up our message with a classic story told in different manner, different ways. I have my own variation to this story. 
uh, just to open up our minds to this theme the Lord provides. One stormy day in a small town, there was a rainfall warning just like the other week. And the town began to experience flooding. Everyone rushes, running away. Lifeboats from the city were running around to save lives. And everyone began to scumper from their flooded homes. But there was a small church, and inside was a single pastor sitting on the altar and does not move. And the first people who went in to run to him were the elders of the church. They ran up to him and told him, Pastor, come quickly. We have a lifeboat for you, ready for you. Come. But the pastor had something in mind and said, No, there's no need for me to run. The Lord will provide for me and save me. And the elders left. Few hours later, the flood water rises up to the altar. The pastor is now standing, looking around. A lifeboat zooms through the door with few neighbors, calling out, Pastor, we will save you. Come with us. But the pastor said, no, don't worry about me. I prayed the Lord will provide and he will save me. The lifeboat zooms off. Few hours later, the water has risen on the kisame, overflowing every musical instrument in the altar. But the pastor is holding on to the roof, now swimming. Another lifeboat enters in, and the neighbors ask the pastor to jump to the boat. Pastor, they are saying, the whole town is now flooding, don't you know? And the pastor responded, Yes, I know, it's flooding, but don't worry, the Lord will provide, the Lord will save me. few hours later, the water runs over the roof of the church, and the pastor was drowned. Later in heaven, he met God, and he asked questions. By the way, in, in heaven, there's no more asking of questions. He said, why, Lord, why? I had so much faith on you. I pray that you will save me, that I pray that you will provide for me. Do you know God's response? According to the story, God said, what are you talking about, Pastor? I sent three lifeboats for you. You are so hard-headed and stubborn. What more do you want? But still, graciously, I save you, and you are now in heaven. Are you not glad that you are in heaven? You know, this is just a story. It's the same story that you have heard in different versions. But, you know, you know based from this story, I was thinking, uh, I think the pastor must be a Filipino. And he must be an Ilongo, like me. Very hard-headed, stubborn, you know. You know, sometimes we pastors are like that, I confess. Hard-headed. But there's a lot of lessons to be learned in our experience with the Lord, in our walk with Him, especially in the area of God's provision. One lesson is this, God's provision in our lives comes in different creative ways. It's myriads of ways and means. It's sometimes we don't even know. It requires shifting of perspective, change of mindset, that God knows everything and He provides in different manner. Second is we don't get to sit idly, just waiting for God's provision. We have to be in the spirit of obedience. It's faith that walks and works. After all, faith that does not work is dead. And third lesson is, sometimes God's provide seems it's not fair, but He provides in human eyes. Sometimes we cannot compare our experiences with each other. The truth is, God deals with us personally and according to our different needs, to what is best for Him, to His will and to His purpose, God provides. But this is a reminder to all of us, a principle of faith, the Lord does provide for us each and every day of our lives. And that is the reason why you are here. 
This leads us to our message entitled, The Lord Provides. The first question that we will ask, we'll look at the background. When was the name of God, Jehovah Jireh, was mentioned? And when was the time that a place was called, The Lord Will Provide? It's in Genesis chapter 22. Jehovah Jireh. Yahweh Yireh, that's, that's the original. And the word Yahweh there is the tetragrammaton, the four little word name of God that many Orthodox Jews do not mention because they might mention the name of God. Not right. So we use the word Jehovah, Chira. And this passage is very rich passage to expound. We just scratch the surface. For one message, Genesis chapter 22, narrative is one of the most disturbing account in the Bible. It's a startling story from Genesis chapter 12 on to the end of Genesis chapter 20. We are eagerly waiting for the promise of the son of Abraham and Sarah. Finally, Genesis chapter 21, we hear that the son was born in the person of Isaac. But these words in Genesis chapter 22, we are perplexed. It's perplexing, disturbing account. Why? Because at this time, there was a command from God. He told Abraham, take your son, your only son, whom you love with a name, Isaac, and there's a place go to the region of Moriah and there's something that you will do there sacrifice him there as a burnt offering on a mountain I will show you that's 22 verse 2 the command is disturbing because first it contradicts the promises that had been made to Abraham previously concerning his son Genesis chapter 12 it contradicts the work of God would accomplish through Isaac. How could God accomplish the work of blessing the nation, that making Abraham to be the father of many nations, if Isaac would be sacrificed and will die if Isaac were dead? How could God accomplish that? Secondly, it's a disturbing command because this command does not agree with the character of God that we know. We know God is good, God is faithful, God is gracious. But in the scripture, when you look at in other places, strictly condemn, condemns, forbid the practice of child sacrifice. It's not in the heart of God. It's practiced by the pagan world. And here, we hear tells Abraham to do it. You know what about Abraham? You see, how perplexing must have been this command to him. Although we don't have the record what Abraham was thinking, what's going on in his mind. Is he thinking what we are thinking? But we are detached personally. So Abraham really leave this story. And in Genesis 22 verse 3 it says, He actually obeyed early the next morning. Abraham got up and loaded his donkey, took with him two of his servants and his son Isaac. And when he had cut enough wood for the burnt offering, he set up the place God had told him about. And in the next verse, verse 4, we knew that there's a three-day journey from the place to the land of Moriah. Three-day journey, and it was be, it must be an agonizing journey for Abraham. Perplexing for me and you, but agonizing for Abraham because this is his experience. But let me tell you this in advance. In the beginning, this story is disturbing. But at the end, it's very clear, understandable, illuminating, and very comforting to Abraham. Though Abraham journeyed towards Moriah with heavy heart, but he journeyed in courage home, comforted, reassured 
of one of the great promise in the Bible, God provides, the Lord will provide Jehovah Jireh. Allow me to submit to you three events, chronological events in the life of Abraham as set forth from verses 1 to verse 14. First is the test of God to Abraham, verses 1 and 2. Second is the obedience, the response of Abraham to God, verses 3 to 10. And finally, last, of course, is the provision of the Lord, verses 20. 12 to 14. First, the test of God. Verses 1 and 2, it says there, sometime later, God tested Abraham. Sometime later, God tested Abraham. Now, remember there are two calls of God on Abraham's life, the first is in Genesis chapter 12. He was called to leave his homeland, his country, or of Chaldees, that's presently Babylon, leave his father and work and go to the land that God will show him. That's the promised land. He does not know that land. That's beyond his imagination. But he obeyed. Second call was Genesis chapter 22, the call to offer Isaac. And I observed its similarity to go to Moriah to offer Isaac. Our question now is, which is more challenging? Which was more difficult? What is leaving his homeland from Or of Chaldees to the promised land? Or was it more challenging for him to leave home, including Sarah, his wife, for Moriah to sacrifice his son. You know, the story of Abraham is like our journey in this passing of time. You know, one lesson that we need to learn is that finishing well is more difficult than starting well. Abraham is now on the finishing line. Yes, it's difficult for him to leave his homeland. It requires great faith. But his journey to Moriah was even more challenging because he got to finish his course. Brothers and sisters, this is called the ultimate test. This is the defining moment of his life. But let us understand Although standing well in the Christian life matters, but compared to finishing well, the latter is more challenging and it's demanded from us. The scriptures calls us to finish well. I want you to look at verse 1. God has said, Abraham, these words are for the readers, not for Abraham. Moses, the writer, wants the reader to know that this was a test. But the problem is, Abraham doesn't know that this is a test. God tested Abraham, Genesis 22, verse 1. And this was echoed by the writer of Hebrews in Hebrews eleven eighteen By faith, Abraham, when God tested him, offered Isaac as a sacrifice. Why did God do that? Do you know what's the purpose? Do you know what's the implication of our testings, examinations of life? One primary purpose is on Abraham's character to reveal the reality of who Abraham was. It is, it is possible to believe God when it seems impossible to believe God. That's, that's it. Do you, have, do you know the pain of killing and burning a son to be sacrificed? Abraham's heart was tested. His emotion was tested. Culturally to us, it's unacceptable. It's horrible. It's brutal. It's painful. It's beyond our minds and our hearts. It's not right, really. Imagine, this is the son of the promise, Isaac. They have waited for 20 years for the birth of Isaac. They have waited until he was 100 years old and about 90 years old for Sarah. This is the miracle child, the miracle baby. 
that he is the most treasured possession and we need to understand between 21 chapter 21 and chapter 22 the call to offer isaac is no less than 20 years 20 years waiting and now there's isaac his name means laughter 20 years of laughter in the home si aw si kuning bata bibo kaayo you know they rejoice every day with isaac isaac brought laughter in the home but god is going to test abraham god is asking laughter laughter you know Isaac was not existing even in a dream. He only exists because of the promise of God. But it's a command of God to offer him. Do you know what's the response? Abraham obeyed without question. He did not ask for God's logical reason. He did not ask why. The theologians call that trust. It's a faith that is alive. So in the whole personality of Abraham, his faith was tested, his will was tested, his intellect was tested, his emotion was tested, his whole total personality was tested. Remember, this is a test, and we must understand this about our God. God never tempts people. James chapter 1, verse 13, God test them. God test us. What's the difference between tempting and testing? The evil one tempts people with evil to make them stumble and fall. But God, when God tests his people, it's for the purpose of strengthening. It's the purpose of refining our character. Then tempting, testing, share the same common kind of test but the purpose of god and satan are quite different satan seeks to destroy god test to purify our faith and character when god tests those who belong to him it is to strengthen and refine them and sometimes god's people fail that test sometimes they flung the test but even then when they flung the test God uses that failure to refine them and call them back again to him. One Jewish rabbi even said, there is no creator here on earth whom God does not test. We are all tested, aware or not. Yes, we are. Life constantly springs little pieces of life. Every day is an examination day for us. We are always confronted with multiple choices. We are always confronted with throw or false, you know. And life is not a selfie camera that you need to pose before the shot. Sometimes it is just plainly given to us. It does not tell us to smile. That's the test. Do you know what's the testing has something to do with for us and with us? Troubles test our courage. Temptation test our strength. Failures test our perseverance. And many times friendship test our loyalty. Do you still unfriend your friend? Do you still like them? Like, like, like? Oh. Marriage crisis test our love for each other daily. And sometimes within the church, family, you know, it tests our bond together. Sometimes we quarrel, right? But the Lord tests us that in the midst of all these things, He tests us our bond of love for each other. And in this test, remember, God is watching us. And in his heart, he calls us to call upon him. And when we call upon him, he will always be there. Because Jehovah Jireh, 
the Lord will provide. It reminds us that passing life's examination is not rewarded with written certificate of passing from PRC. Do you know what's the rewards of passing God's test? It's great. For Abraham 22:15, all the families of the earth will be blessed through him. And Abraham's descendants will be like the suns of the sea, the stars of the sky. And we will be part of that blessing as God's family. Don't you know that we, we, believers of Christ, were all adopted sons and daughters of Abraham, adopted to the covenant of promise, grafted into the whole family of God. But it all started with the call of Abraham, and he obeyed without relenting. Brothers and sisters, the walk of tests is very difficult for Abraham. When Isaac probably said in the scripture, where's the lamb of sacrifice, dad? Abraham, without bothering an eyelash, said, Jehovah, Jaira, the Lord sees, the Lord will provide. Indeed, the Lord provided a lamb. In application of the above test question, we need to ask this question as well. What's the test of our life, of your life and mine? Will we give to God the thing that matters most? to us? That's the question. And will we trust God to provide? Each testing was an opportunity to demonstrate to God and to ourselves the strength of our character. When the rubber meets the road, when we cannot smile anymore, that's the test. You know, the doctor consulting, confronting his client, is having his or her dedication tested. The Hippocratic Oath, remember? The lawyer consulting, helping his client, is having his integrity tested. The ministers, pastors, and all the servers working as they prepare something, their honesty is tested. The teacher preparing his or her lesson is having her devotion, commitment, they said. The managers, the managers with wisdom, the businessman on honesty in their scales, even the driver, even the mechanic under a car, their character is tested. All professionals, it's having their character tested. You see, your kindness is tested daily. You see, your humility is tested daily. If we are hurting deep within, you know, our perseverance, our generosity is tested when we are confronted with a need. We all are tested. But like Abraham, we have to resolve to walk by faith and not by sight. Secondly, the obedience of Abraham. Let's consider the obedience of Abraham. Three things. Number one, it is immediate. Second, it is unquestioning. Third, it's full of faith. You know, in the past, Abraham's faith is not like that. Abraham's faith is not perfect in the past. There was a time that he was so fearful, fearful, you know. Remember that, that almost the wife, you know, Sarah, before God knows everything. And sometimes Abraham allowed that fear of the unknown to get to him. But in this narrative of his life, he simply obeyed the Lord. 
From the moment he woke up in the morning, he saddled his donkey to the moment he got a knife, lifted up his knife to slay his son, Abraham simply obeyed. And for three days, Abraham journeyed with Isaac and his two servants. Verse 4, on the third day, Abraham lifted up his eyes and saw the place from afar. And this is very dramatic. How did he know that it was Moriah? The Lord must have revealed that to him. But listen to what he told his servants in verse 5. He said to his servants, stay here with the donkey while I and the boy go over there. We will worship and then we will come back to you. We will come back to you. That's plural form. Even though he was thinking that there's something that will happen to Isaac. But that's faith. We will worship. You know, an act of sacrifice is a worship, is a form of worship. When you sacrifice in the practice of your profession and vocation, that's worship before God. In other words, Abraham said, literally, I and the boy will go over there and worship and will come again. That's plural form. How could he had said that? He knew the commands of offering his son, but he said, dead or alive, we will return. That's faith. And this is evident when Isaac also wears the missing sacrifice that I see the fire, I see the wood, but where's the lamb? He said, God will provide for himself the lamb for burnt offering my son. And they went together, verse 8, in complete obedience, all the way, complete, no reservation. And when they reached the place God had told him, Abraham built an altar, and you know the story. But there's one thing that I've seen. When he bound his son Isaac and laid him on the altar on top of the wood, by the way, I think Isaac had faith also. It's difficult to imagine a young person that would not be able to escape from Abraham's hand. Isaac himself is a willing sacrifice. He trusted his father. Sabi ni siya pa, wala siya naglugnot-lugnot, wala magjaba, wala musinggit, tabang. Patyon ko sa akong papa, nagtrust yun siya sa iyang papa. The obedience of Abraham was perfect, down to the point of lifting the knife to slay his son. The question is, why on earth will he do that? Why would Abraham obey completely? We have a New Testament answer. You go to Hebrews chapter 11, 17 to 19. This is very helpful for the exposition of this passage. It said this, My faith, Abraham, when God tested him, offered Isaac as a sacrifice. He who has embraced the promise was about to sacrifice his one and only son. Even though God had said to him, it is through Isaac that your offspring will be reckoned. And in verse 19, let's listen to this. Abraham reasoned that God would even raise the dead. So in a manner of speaking, he did receive Isaac back from death. On Abraham believed that one of the ways that God could provide, granting that Isaac could be dead, God will, has all the power to raise Isaac from the dead. And figuratively speaking, he did receive him back alive, alive from death. From death. It's an obedience. It's an obedience to the point of death. Let me give you some comparison. I would like to make some comparison with the story of the gospel. This is the greatest picture of love of the Father. Remember John 3.16? The Almighty God allowed Abraham to spare his son from death because there's a ram that was provided as a substitute. But let us remind it, brothers and sisters, there was a day, and we will celebrate that one of these weeks. It's called Holy Week. I don't know why they call that Holy Week. 
when Almighty God had a dagger in His hand, figuratively speaking. It was headed towards the heart of His Son, Jesus Christ, at Calvary. When Jesus Christ cried out in anguish, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, meaning, my God, my God, my Father, why hast thou forsaken me? That's a cry. And that dagger was not stopped. It was flung into his heart at Calvary. And at Calvary, let us re be reminded, there was no voice from heaven that shouted, stop, stop, do not harm my son. God's only beloved son was allowed to die According to the Apostle Paul, Romans chapter 8, verse 32, He who did not spare His Son, but gave Him up for us all, and how will He not also along with Him graciously gives us all things? That's the same. Jehovah Jireh, the Lord provides. That's how much God loves us all. But the ultimate provision, by the way, is no less than our Lord Jesus Christ. And Jesus Christ is more than enough for each one of us. Finally, and lastly, the last event in his life, the provision, the provision of God. Verses 11 to 14. Abraham believed that God is able to raise Isaac from the dead if necessary, and he's willing to let go. He's willing to let go. Thankfully, good na lang, it did not come to that, for the Lord provided a substitute. But what's God's provision? Right as Abraham was about to slaughter his son, his only son, Isaac, whom he loved, an angel of the Lord called to him from heaven, Abraham, Abraham he said, here I am. And you could almost hear the urgency of those voice. Stop. You could also hear the beating of Abraham's heart. The relief after that. And the Lord said, verse 12, Do not lay a hand on the boy. Do not do anything to him. Now, Anal, that you fear God, because you have not withheld from me your son, your only son. And Abraham looked up, and there in a thicket he saw a ram caught by its horn. He went over and took the ram and sacrificed it as a burnt offering instead of his son. So Abraham called that place Jehovah Jireh, the Lord will provide. And to this day it is said on the mountain, the Lord will be provided. There's a painting of the British Museum of Art at Trafalgar Square, London. The artist illustrates Abraham covering Isaac's eyes with his left hand and with a dagger holding the knife at his right hand. And at the background, coat in a thorn bush in the shadow is a ram. It's a lamb. And we know the story. Abraham sacrificed the lamb instead. It's a substitute sacrifice for Isaac. And God provides. God provides. Abraham and Isaac coming down from Moriah after. Oh, what a joy. What a joy. And by the way, Moriah is the present day Jerusalem. It's where the temple was erected and where Calvary was located. That's Moriah. A lot of offering before God. Abraham passed the test of God for three days examination more than all the exams of this world. And Abraham topped the test in the exam of his life. Let me end with this a little emphasis of one word here. The word provide where it got the word provision and providence it's actually translated in the original ra'a it's really to see god sees so yairi and ra'a they have the same 
root word, by the way. So Abraham lifted up his eyes and saw the ram. That's Ra'ah. And God sees what we need because God is good. He sees everything. He knows everything because he sees it. He will provide it for us. And that's what exactly did. And the place was called Yahweh Yaira. God will provide. God provides. He did what God did for Abraham and hundreds and thousands of biblical characters in history, including us. God continues to do that for his people. And he is a perfect provider because he knows exactly what we need, where we need it, when we need it. It was always provided at the right time, at the right place, at the right thing. Yairi and Ra'ah, they have one root word to see, meaning we have a God who sees and a God, the God who provides. Yesterday, God saw what you need today. Why I'm saying is, where did that ram, that lamb come from? Do you think it's just dropped from heaven instantly? No, no, I don't think so. Days before Abraham arrived at that spot, there must be one shepherd who lost a lamb. It's not just any lamb, but perfect lamb, healthy lamb, and blemish lamb. God provides perfect gift for that particular time. What I'm saying is, we have a God who sees and a God who provides in advance. Remember the donkey that our Lord Jesus Christ was riding entering Jerusalem. We'll celebrate that, the Palaspas, you know, we have that Palaspas tradition of the Filipinos, bintitahan para pagtabok sa mga panulay. No. No. The donkey was used. It not, it's not yet saddled, it's not yet used. Untouched. Untouched. And the Lord asked the disciples, you get the donkey. Tell that owner, I need to use them. It was given freely and it was preserved until the Lord used it. What I'm saying is, God provides in advance. In our rhyme, God knows, God sees in advance. And that's the reality of our God. God started to provide even before the need became apparent to Abraham. Abraham did not ask for a ram. He did not pray for that, by the way. He was so silent. We don't know his mind. It's not recorded. He said nothing. I'm sure he was praying while walking, but he is not asking. I'm sure, I'm sure of that. He is not asking to provide a lamb instead. No. His heart is really to offer Isaac. He's groaning in pain, let me tell you. Just because we don't ask, doesn't keep God from providing for us. He is a loving Father who knows what we need before we can ask. That's what the Lord Jesus said in the Gospel. That's what Paul said in his letters. Before we can ask, God knows. We have a God who sees and a God who provides. Incorporated in the Lord's Prayer. Remember, there's a phrase. Give us this day our daily bread. Let me give some commentary. That's an acknowledgement that our daily food, our daily need, our daily bread mentioned there comes from the hands of the Father. That's why we pray daily for food. Have you prayed this prayer? Perhaps we may not have feast every day, but we always have food. There are times that there's no banquet, you know, but we have our rice and bulad, you know. Many times there was, there was celebration. Of course, you have birthdays, you have anniversaries, and all of this. But one thing, God sees, God provides. While looking at your faces, I saw contentment. I think you cannot relate praying this prayer. Give us this day our daily bread. 
nakaampo na mo ani wala no because i believe you are so blessed your refrigerator was so packed with microwavable food na dito and our stomachs were so full that we seldom pray this prayer do you know what we pray self control self control not lord give me something to eat today but lord help me not to eat so much self control but needless to say the fact remains in the scripture everything we enjoy is from the hand of our god who sees and who provides let me close one of the spiritual writer that i love is watchman nee one of my favorites on spirituality watchman nee said we approach god like little children with open hands begging for candies begging for gifts to the father to give us laughter smile joy and because god is good god is faithful he fills our hands with good things what are those good things life health children that loves us money recognition healing marriage family it's there of course grandchildren mga lolo mga lolo lola we have this nice as define as nice nice everything home place to work good job all the blessings that we count on thanksgiving day we are told count your blessings and like children watchman ni said we rejoice in what we have received we run around comparing with each other what we receive just to praise the lord like a child rejoicing but said when our hands are finally full god says to us one day my child i long to have fellowship with you reach out your hand take my hand but we are saying to god no we cannot do that because our hands are full god we cannot we cry but god is saying to us put these things aside take my hand i said no we cannot it's hard to put them down i love them i learn to love them thank you lord you have given that yes yes but god is saying to us i am the one who give them to you in the first place and we say to god god we know but it's really hard please don't take these things aside and do you know what's money concluded this story analogy he said god will always answer to us quietly you must let it go you must put it down and reach out your hand to me brothers and sisters did someone say to you in your life you have to let it go you're holding on to lightly that's the reason why you are struggling kay dili ka mag let go did an angel in your life saying to you murag gunit ka kaba gunit you know we could only find relief and joy if little little will learn how to let go and let god intervene two principles before we leave in application the principle of open palm the principle of open palm god to feel us with a lot of joy in our hands but the lord will say to us this is the principle of open palm i want to bring you closer to me ongoing discipleship with me and i personally believe even in my life 65 years of erratic discipleship i call that erratic discipleship ups and downs god orchestrates the affairs of life good bad better worse joyful sad to bring us to the place of faith that will be in god 
alone, nothing left but us and God alone. But when we are with God alone, placing everything aside, it's the sweetest place of joyful experience with Him. And second principle, the principle of holding lightly. Remember that? Not tightly, holding lightly. I have many things in my hands, but the process of growing older is nothing more than this. Learning how to hold lightly the things God has given us. Knowing, knowing we cannot keep them forever anyway, and we cannot take them with us also. At any given moment, he can take them away. But remember, he knows he sees, and he will provide also. This is a principle of the Lord gives, the Lord takes. I remember the principle of Job, and he gives again, and it's more than the first. Let me tell you this. Are we pressured of these two principles? The principle of open palm and the principle of holding lightly? Let's continue to do that. Watchman Nee said, God will always say to us, you must, if you want to walk with me, you must, and you will, and you will discover nothing is lost actually when we have the Lord. We have everything that we need in the first place. Remember that God saw yesterday what you need today, and God provides. He will not even spare his son just to give us all things that we need. The blessing of God will continually fill our hearts this morning. Remember, Jehovah Jireh, the Lord will provide. Let us pray. Gracious Father, here's your word. Allow your word to sink deep within our hearts and we could practice these principles daily. In Jesus' name, amen.